Welcome to Empower to Grow, the podcast. I am your host, Hanan al Basha, the business doctor. Following our conversations with empowered women who woke up one day and consciously claimed, I am more than enough, I am worthy, I am empowered to grow. And along their empowering journey towards realizing their own potential and their quest for growth, they became a beacon of hope and guidance for others. May you also find your inner power to grow. We are um, talking today about healing your inner child wounds. Why? Because it's a disruptive conversation. Why? Because we all know, as uh, Nihal had put in her post when she announced this, we all have inner child wounds, whether we'd like to admit it or not. And um, part of, I think, of our work independently and even collectively has been realizing how much those inner child wounds have been impacting us and affecting us on a personal level, and more importantly then, how they're impacting our lives and our interactions within our communities, within our relationships, within even our work environments. What are inner child wounds? In a very simple term, and everyone's gonna explain it further in their own terms and from their own worldview lens and perspective and professional opinion, um, inner childhood wounds are related or inner child wounds are related to things, um, instances, uh, things that happened as we are growing within our nurture, without, within our nature that got impacted by our environments and that had become and developed into blocks one way or another. And why is that important? Because research has shown to date that 95% of what dictates our actions, reactions and interactions is our subconscious and that is mainly shaped by our nurture and our upbringing. And that, believe it or not, has been mostly um, shaped up from the ages of zero to seven. So you can imagine that we have been impacted quite a bit by that. And we might not be aware that these patterns of behaviors are impacting our adult life and they are mostly negatively affecting us and how we want or stopping us or blocking us from achieving our greatness. As uh, Les Brown says, there's greatness within you. So I'd like to welcome my um, amazing, amazing friends and experts. Uh, Nihali Gandhi is a licensed clinical professional counselor. Hi, Nihal. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and Mahita Marzu has a certified, get this, peace of mind leadership coach. So that is amazing. And a pioneer coach with positive intelligence. And I'd like to introduce myself for those who don't know me. My name is Hanan Al-Basha. I'm a business and mindset coach, uh, aka the business doctor. And it is my mission and my passion in life to empower those in their business and in their mind, but mostly talk to ourselves nicely and be positive around it. So that is just us in a nutshell. As I said, the objective of this conversation, disruptive conversation, as I like to call them, and why we're not talking about tattoo, taboos and we're not talking about things that, oh my God, how could they bring this up? But actually there are certain things that we are kind of just ignoring, kind of shielding, kind of you know, um, covering up one way or another. And we just want to bring this to the light. So we start addressing it. And once we start addressing or having awareness first, and then beyond that, addressing it and hopefully, hopefully initiate a healing process for us all. So what we will cover is inner child wound. What it is, is in terms of context and impact from the expert's worldview lens, we're going to each share three recommendations to kickstart our healing. And then we're going to have, as I said earlier, our Q&A session. So as I said, now our hosts, I'm going to uh, pass the floor to each of them. They're going to kind of just introduce themselves a bit further, tell them a bit, tell you a bit about where they come from. And then um, beyond that, explain what inner child wound is in terms of definition from their worldview lens. So Nihal, I'm going to uh, stop the share here. And this is where we get personal. <laughs> Nihal, please lead the way. Hi. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Hanan, on this uh, amazing journey, our, our, our healing journey as well into, uh, into our, uh, our own inner childhood wounds. Um, so my name, hello, everybody. My name is Nihal Gindi, and um, I am a licensed clinical counselor here in the Washington, D.C. area. 
Um, I currently am working at the University of Maryland um, Counseling Center and uh, work with uh, undergraduate and graduate populations. Uh, I have experience in um, private practice and outpatient mental health clinics. So that's just a quick uh, um, background uh, synopsis of me. Uh, so we're going to, before I actually start, I want to do a disclaimer. Um, there, there might be things that um, I might say, um, talk about, mention that could trigger some things. Um, and uh, so um, if, there, if you are getting some sort of emotional reaction in anything I'm saying, a memory, anything like that, um, please feel free to kind of take a break, uh, come back, or um, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, if it has heightened anything in you, um, just let me know at the end of the uh, webinar and I'd be uh, more than happy to kind of decompress whatever was heightened. So that's a disclaimer. Um, so let's start. When we talk about um, our healing journey, I'll, I'll, it's, it's going to be, I'll take you on a little small healing journey um, when we talk about the inner child. Um, when we want to understand how to heal the inner child, we have to know where it started from, where the wound um, came about in order to heal it at its core. Um, so I say, you know, if, um, if we don't address our childhood wounds, then our romantic relationships, our other relationships will. And this is how we first start um, in um, healing ourselves first and then others, our relationships with others. Um, and when we talk about our, um, our core as a child, we have to look at, our, at the beginning and our relationship, um, our primary relationships. And uh, when we look at our primary relationship, it's with our caregiver and how we relate and how we attach. Um, and this brings me to my first kind of uh, pointer, and that is looking at our attachment styles with our caregivers and um, how our relationship with or how we attach um, to our caregiver will be an indicator to how we attach in relationships as adults. Um, so we identified um, through research um, four different attachment styles. Now, why am I talking to you about this or how does this kind of um, come in uh, at the very beginning of our healing journey? Again, it's understanding how we've attached to the caregiver, our primary, the very first step um, in our being. Um, so talking about the different attachment styles, um, we have four. One is the secure, and then we have three, which is avoidant um, and the um, anxious and the fearful anxious. And I want you to kind of, um, again, as a recommendation, just, uh, I'll be talking about them briefly, but I want you to see where you identify, um, which one you identify with, okay? So the secure attachment style, um, that's where the, um, as a child, you feel confident um, in your um, uh, attachment with your caregiver. You know that you are going to um, explore and that caregiver is emotionally available for you. So you can go explore and then come back when you're feeling in distress and you know that they're there. So the caregiver is sensitive to your needs. They are responsive to what it is that you're needing from them when you are in distress. Now, how does that relate into a, an attachment um, in a, our adulthood? Um, you um, do not fear autonomy. You do not fear intimacy. Um, you are able to be close in relationships emotionally. So that's the secure one. We ultimately all wanna be in the secure box, okay? Um, but then sometimes we are insecure and we have the insecure uh, attachment wounds and uh, we can kind of alternate back and forth from secure to insecure. Um, but um, the first insecure one is the avoidant. Now here, the child um, uh, is um, independent of their caregiver they have learned that their caregiver is emotionally unavailable for them. So when they are um, in distress, they do not seek attachment to their caregiver. Um, and that relates or translates into our adult relationships in, um, in not um, in um, fearing intimacy. So you are not able to, they've learned to kind of, um, when they are in distress, they self-soothe, they don't go to um, their caregiver. Um, and so as an adult, you are not um, uh, comfortable 
uh, in close relationships emotionally. Um, and so you fear intimacy there. Um, the third one is anxious. So here, your attachment style is that you're overly clingy, you're overly dependent. The caregiver was um, uh, very inconsistent in their responsiveness to you. So as an adult, you are completely um, uh, in, in, um, uh, emotionally intimate, you are clingy, you are fearing um, actually rejection. So you are like, um, um, that's how you are attaching because you fear that, um, that they will um, leave you. Um, then the fourth one, which is the last one is the fearful anxious. So again, the caregiver was inconsistent in their ability to be emotionally available for you. Sometimes they're sensitive and they're there and sometimes they're neglectful. And um, the, the child is um, sometimes clingy and dependent and sometimes rejecting. And how does that translate as an adult? Uh, you want the intimacy, you want the closeness, but then you don't trust the other and you don't depend on the other as well. So it's like come close, but not too close. Um, why are all these important? Because they bring up the wounds, um, whether it's avoidant, you felt abandoned, um, whether it's the anxious, you felt rejected, whether it's the fearful anxious, you felt the loss, you felt the chaos in your surroundings and your environment. So it's important to recognize as a first step in your healing, what attachment style are you? And um, so then how does this translate and how does this help us in our healing? we move on to the second recommendation, and that is um, accepting that the caregiver, um, accepting okay, that- Nihal, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you there. I'm, Go I'm gonna interrupt you because I don't want to finish up all the recommendations, okay. but I, I, I wanted, I, I love the, the fact that you've, um, you've displayed or you've, you've portrayed everything about the attachment styles, because that's, I think if, the whole point of this conversation is for people to take everything we are talking about and mm -hmm. use it as reflection, as like yeah. literally food for thought. Yes. And the, that's, that's, our, that's the mission. We're presenting the food. We can't force people to take it. We can't force people to digest it. And we can't force them to, to benefit from it. But the mm -hmm. point is, this is our mission, to present it. Now I want people to start reflecting on everything in terms of the attachment, but more importantly, as you presented, this is not just about how it impacts them in the relationships, but then they will realize that also reflects in, in the work environment. This also reflects in the parenting Every, style. This reflects, in, you know, how they conduct themselves as humans. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll keep the further parts about the awareness and everything. I know what you what you're okay. about to say. Okay. I can't wait, but we're going to keep it a bit further. I want sure. um, Mahitab to follow on that thought, please. First, of course, please do introduce yourself and kind of give context of why you got to that point of what you present and the value you're adding. But more importantly, I know you're talking about the saboteurs. And I think this is a very, uh, like it's a progressive uh, thought from the uh, attachment style. So You've got the floor, Mahita. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be with you today. Uh, I'm a Peace of Mind certified coach. And as um, Hanan said, I'm a pioneer coach with the positive intelligence. And I'll take the world peace of mind with, um, with the story I'm going to share. But before I, I share the story, I want to say something. When Hanan, we were discussing about the, this, and she told me it's about healing inner child wound. I said, no, 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 no. I'm a coach, I deal with the present and the future. There are professional people dealing with the past and I don't have the qualification. And then she told me we have a counselor and Nihali Geza said, okay, I'm on board. Because, and the reason I'm on board, many of the people I've been coaching, they are stuck, not moving forward because they didn't heal the past. And in many occasions, they have to heal it to move forward. Sometimes they, the awareness is high and they could move forward and we can work on it. But sometimes it's really, it's important to heal it. I'll go back to peace of mind with a story I had when I was young, because the wound could be a trauma, could be something small, could be a comment. And I remembered yesterday a story 
I we I was probably six or seven. We were in a in a in a like a, how to say in a we're traveling with a group of people. It was a big event outside Egypt, and we were traveling. And then my my mother was always late, always late. And my younger brother he had problems. He was a difficult eater. This is a priority. And I remember there was like a trip, and we entered the bus. We were the last to enter the bus. And then everyone was looking at us. Probably I was not aware we're late. And every and then a lady came out and she's like, we have been waiting for you and you cannot delay the bus. And I was like, as a child, I got scared. I remember this story very well. And it was so, I was so annoyed. I was young. I was angry at the lady. My mother was a strong character. She answered her, but I took as, as if she was yelling to me. And we moved on. My mother didn't care. We continued, but I was, I mean, it really affected me. And I remember that when I grew up, I was so sensitive to time. If I'm five minutes late, I'm anxious. I was like, it really affected me. If I have a meeting, if I'm dropping the kids, if I'm attending like a, a school play, I have to be on time. I'm even early. So this how this comment from this lady, an outsider, affected me. And it only I realized that time is not as dangerous as it is because I used to go like really worried. This is why I said, no, it's not worth it. I'm a peace of mind because I'm here. And I remember in a coaching session, the coach asked me, how do you feel when other people are late? And I said, I said, it's okay. They have their excuses. And he said, and why you feel anxious if you are late? Why wouldn't people give you an excuse? And I was like, I was like, it was a simple question. And it was like, as if I was put in the mirror, it's okay, everyone. And it's, and by the way, I got healed. We're talking about two years ago three years ago. So it's not, it's really, I'm old enough. So I stayed really worried about that. And this is what we're talking about here. It's being aware. It's mm -hmm. like to move forward now. Yes, I was early for our meeting, but yet I couldn't access because my computer was like not working in normal circumstances. I will feel worried. I will feel panic. And I was like, it was not as strong. It was there. But I was like, I was able to say myself, it's okay. What is the worst case scenario? I'll jump in late. They will start without me. It's not a big deal. But reaching this part of saying it's okay, that's not easy. And this is when we go into the recommendation. I, I, I don't want to take the time, but I want to say, Nihal said healing, there is the past. And while we have this, we have, like you mentioned, our subconscious saboteurs which mm -hmm. is the judge. We are judging ourselves, we are judging others, and we are judging circumstances. So, and everyone in his DNA has the judge. If you tell me I'm not judgmental, well, you're lying to yourself and those around you because we are all, even coach, counselor, it's part of our DNA. And this is what Nihal was saying, the awareness. Mm -hmm. Yes, the awareness. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm smiling with your story because I know how impactful these things are. And sometimes it's amazing how something really, you would think it's an insignificant situation. It's an insignificant um, um, word or, or statement that was thrown your way growing up. And you take it. And I think that part is, I always now say, other people's opinions does not become your truth. And I think that's where the problem starts happening is where these things, and, so, and because they're subconscious, because they happened in the past, or sometimes they're even happening as you are growing older in your young adulthood, where you're still very impressionable, that's where you take these statements as your own truth and you act accordingly. So for me, and I shared the story more than once, and Daddy, I love you. Thank you very much. But this I have to share about him. <laughs> it was one of those statements that was, you know, my dad would come to sports day in school 
And uh, he'd be cheering for me. He'd be cheering me in the relay and in the long jump and the high jump and all of this, but he'd be cheering me in a mocking way, in a way like in Arabic, it says like, which is run my little duckling. And that in Egyptian dialect or in Egyptian culture is very much associated with you being a little chubby kid and there's no way you're going to be <laughs> getting to that thing. But the point is, it was always that. It was like, I tried a lot of sports. I did. I put in the effort. I was like, I'm in the volleyball team. Oh, great. So you're under the net. Oh, I went horseback riding. Oh, that was the first horse with 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 back issues now. And it was always those kind of things. And, and we joked about it. And, you know, he's he's got the charisma and he's got all that. And um, But the point is, that became my truth. And that became my reality that I am not athletic in any way. And there's no... There is no point beyond trying. I should not try. I should not attempt. And I found myself, and this is only something, yet again, my dad, I, I realized like a year or two ago is this is something that I just took as my own reality that I never thought about it. I went into a sport, I tried it, and then I let go. I did not go all in because what's the point? I'm not athletic. And these are the kind of stories that, um, that I like to talk about now or actually to sit and reflect on and to bring up. And Nihal says like every once in a while, she'll get a voice note from me. He's like, I just discovered another one. (laughs) I found another one and this is the time I'm going to get it out. And I keep disintegrating it and disseminating it into the smallest of instances and the smallest of conversations, because now I realize the impact these had on me Mm -hmm. and the, were reflected when I sat and had a very honest talk with myself and through the coaching and through also my best friend's a therapist. So she's been my therapist all my life. (laughs) It's like, we have these sessions, Lou, I miss you. But anyhow, (laughs) it's those kind of things where I realized that Mm -hmm. these patterns of thoughts impacted my behaviors and impacted my actions and they impacted my life. And I had not realized that you would have thought that this was just one relationship. This was just one friendship. This is the way I conducted myself at work. And as you were saying, Matab, I became a perfectionist because I'm not good enough. And, you know, I have an issue with self-worth. And this was for me the way to say, see, I'm great. And one of the things was my teacher, and it was, I was in a British system. So um, Mrs. Bassett, God bless her. <clears throat> I've got bless her soul if she's dead. But anyhow, she's one of the people that negatively impacted me because she made me believe that I could not write, that my English was not good enough, provided I had been in British school ever since I went to school. And Mm -hmm. this was in senior years where we're supposed to be just before we sit our GCSEs. Uh, Yeah, it was GCSEs then and then our GCSEs. And I spent a lifetime believing I can't write. You know, that I do something, even though I went to become the editor-in-chief of the Caravan, the student newspaper in the, in the American University in Karen AC. And, and then beyond that, it impacted me when I realized when I was up writing my doctorate thesis, my doctoral thesis. And when my chair was giving me feedback, one day I just said, you know what, Mrs. Bassett was right. I have a problem with my English. I can't try it. I was like, what's wrong with me? You know, I got to this point in life. How can I not try it? But it's these kind of things. And I heard this expression first when I first started coaching. And it was like the stories we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that made me angry because I'm like, what do you mean? I'm deceiving myself. No, that is the truth. And and Nihal, I'd like you to jump in in this part where it says between the stories we tell ourselves and between actually those stories are revealing inner child wounds. They're revealing historic. They have historical context one way or another. Would that Absolutely. be the case? Yeah, yeah. The, the historical context is a is a major one because um, when we when we you know kind of talking about our caregivers and um, putting ourselves in that context of um, how we are relating with them and how the wounds came about, um, it's actually understanding and accepting that um, you know there are certain um, that they as our caregivers have their own inner child wounds that they were dealing with, they didn't even know they had. Um, And again, this is all part of the awareness of our past, of our old narratives um, and their narratives as well. And when we talk about um, the history, it's understanding and accepting that 
um, there are um, I, what I call, and I think this is something that uh, Mahitev really liked. Um, <laughs> yes. There are generational patterns, um, mm-hmm. just like uh, we have biological epigenetics, uh, uh, bio- biological genetics that are handed down. There are also generational epigenetics that are handed down. Um, so it could be anxiety, it could be trauma um, from one generation, one generation to the other. And um, we don't, I mean, what we have to do is understand what they are, understand that, you know, had they known better, had our caregivers known better, they would have done better. Um, And it's also recognizing that this is what we had needed from them, but we didn't get, okay? And and it it doesn't necessarily, it could be in in so many different situations, uh, as as you were saying, as Mahitab was saying, the wound is understanding where it's coming from, where it's originating from, um, and um, how to break that pattern. So it's also breaking the generational pattern so that you do not pass it on to your children or whoever else it is. Um, The anxiety is a big one. Um, Or or those who are avoidant, uh, like we were saying, the avoidant, they they learn to self-soothe, okay, and then they withdraw. So how are you going to kind of reach out and not give that as well to your, um, you know, your children? Or how are you going to connect? Uh, How are you going to emotionally connect? And so you're breaking that old pattern. Um, And it's, giving yourself the affirmation. It's telling yourself, okay, this is what I needed from them. This is what I need in a particular situation now. So if I am feeling a rejection in my relationship and in, um, with my partner, um, for whatever reason, the, the person who is anxious and is trying to cling on so hard and the partner is withdrawing or moving out and you're feeling that rejection, okay, so how, what is it that I need from this person or this situation right now and um, just affirming um, and touching, mm, mm, getting in tune with the inner child wound, which is the rejection. And um, what is it that I'm needing now? Do I need validation? Do I need acceptance? Do I need to be seen? Do I need to be heard? So um, just accepting um, where your caregiver was and that was all they knew how to do and accepting that you needed this from them, but didn't get it. And how you are now in any situation going to be able to be aware of this. So that's the, that's the history piece. <laughs> yes, that's the history piece. But more importantly, I think when, when also we're talking about the definition of caregiver, it's not just about parents. It's about everyone that was entrusted with yes. taking care of us one way or another, whether that be in it's education. Beautiful. Yep, it could be a coach, it could be a teacher, it could be um, someone who was of primary importance or significance in your life. And uh, an older sibling, that oh, too. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yep. sibling, cousin, whoever that is, yep. that has impacted you one way or another. Yeah, I, 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 am, I, I want you to chime in and especially from a positive intelligence perspective. <laughs> no, I will. I, I really liked when uh, Nihal said about being anxious and I'm, I have a story to tell with uh, everyone. Maybe I'm here to give stories. But no, I that's, remember, that's good. It's context. Great. We need that. I, the generation pattern Nihal said is amazing because we are born already. already we have in our DNA, we inherited something. So growing up, either whatever we have, either it grows, so someone nurtures this by growing, or it is, how to say, you're on the right path, so you escape it. So let me give an example. My mom had a great mother, bless her soul. She was amazing, but she was always worried, always worried something would go wrong. She was so vigilant. And here we, she had the high hypervigilant saboteur. And I remember very well when I was, maybe I told you the story when I was six, seven, and there was like, we're going to visit the pyramids with school. I was so excited. Like, we're going to visit the pyramids. I said, are you sure? I said, yes. Are you, do you know there are dogs, stray dogs there? I said, okay. And you're going to be bitten. Dogs bite everyone. So all the dogs bite every- Yes. If you want to go, you can go. Definitely. I said I was the only one who didn't go and I was happy not to go. So I grew up being scared of dogs. I grew up 
I had so much because she was always worried. I was myself worried with my children. I remember my son, when he was 10, he went for the, or may know he was eight, something like that. And he went with a school trip for five days. I couldn't sleep. Now my son is in another country <laughs> studying and I sleep. Sometimes the hypervigilant happens, comes, but I know how to tame it. This is the point when you inherit my tube, and we're going to do an assessment to know our saboteur later on when we go with the recommendation so everyone knows where he is. My two kids, have, they have a hypervigilant, a little bit high, so they took it from me. So this is what Nihal was saying. We have to be aware. We have to see so we don't continue because it, we pass it on. If I would have realized early on this before having my children, definitely the situation would have been better. However, this brings me, we shouldn't feel guilty because now normally normal circumstances say, oh, if I knew better, if I know, and, and mothers become guilty. We're doing our best. It's okay. We are learning. We are learning in our children. They were learning their children. So we have to have empathy for ourselves. So it is, it is, it is, from this talk, it's important that people don't feel guilty. It's important to say it's okay. There's, we don't have a hundred percent person. <laughs> they don't exist. There, there, there never will be. be. And I don't think we'll yeah. ever have a hundred percent control either. But I think the whole point is, is shifting from that 5% of where your consciousness is the one that is, you know, you're aware of what you're doing and you're doing it consciously and you're doing it um, with purpose. And it is bringing up, it is, I believe it's about changing the conditioning and the programming of the subconscious so that it is on par with you and it is supporting you towards making, um, let's say, empowering acts and stuff. And there's, speaking of, trauma epigenetics and, and, um, and um, generational curses. <laughs> I'll call them curses for now. No, I'm sorry. Um, generational wounds. <laughs> but that also brings into context how one generation to the other, one context, one nurture, one environment, uh, whether that be a political environment or, you know, now we're talking, we are all talking, we have been talking so far about the internal environment. Now looking at the external environment, that also shapes up a lot of our, our subconscious. It shapes up a lot of our inner child wounds because that also becomes generational, you know, where, where we've got parents who grew up in one area or immigrated somewhere else or ran away, you know, they're refugees of some sort or all of this becomes part of the dialogue and becomes part of the actions. And these are also things that have been inherited. For me, I realized that I was born and raised in Kuwait, and so I'm a third culture kid. I was raised in a multicultural a melting pot, but that impacted me in a positive way for sure. But the, the drawback of it was I had felt most of my life, up until really recently, that I'm an outsider. I'm a foreigner. I'm an expat. Even my own country, I felt like that. I felt like an outsider because I did not act the same way. 100%. I did not think the same way. I did not talk the same way. And my, my um, contextual uh, environment was, was a bit different, you know? So I always found myself just getting attracted to those that are really, really, really like me, which really minimized my circle, <laughs> but more importantly, made me feel like, you know what? I don't belong. And then it had to hit me. If I don't belong everywhere, then where do I belong? And I had to deal with that was, was a big, that was one of those aha moments that I said, Nihal, it's like, I just realized this, you know, it's like revealing for me, but it was because I had to go through the exercise. And I think part of what we're talking about is all of this is talking about that we have an awareness that something might not feel right, or something might not fit within our expectations. But those that don't realize that and just keep going through the cycles, and that's why we're having this disruptive conversation, is if you do feel now analyzing, looking at your life, you feel like you have been going through patterns, cyclical patterns, I think this is a time, and thinking that, you know, it's not about me, it's about everyone else, then this is a time where you have to stop and say, hang on a second, 
<laughs> let me go internal now. <laughs> let me go inward rather than just be angry or be resentful or be critical outwardly. So anyhow, take us inward. Take Can us I say something? Sorry. Sure. For, uh, let me, there is a comment here from Ahmed, and I think you're answering it in a way, and maybe oh. the, the problem, he's saying, thanks, Ahmed, for being here. The problem is when there is an inner child wound we know nothing about, it is playing in the subconscious, all the stories you lady stated, you are all aware of. So I think the question is like, how do we know we have an inner child? Won't. And I think Nihal is the one who could. All the stories you ladies stated you are all aware of. How do you know? Um, do you? You, will, um, you will know by the, um, how you're reacting to it. You'll know it in your body. You'll sense it in your, um, your physical um, responses. You will notice it in... Um, uh, you'll notice it coming up in, in like, like um, Hanan was saying, you'll feel a certain resentment. You'll feel a certain, um, um, your, your critic, your inner critic is going to start coming up. You're going to um, question things. It's going to, it will come up. It will come up in how you're relating to yourself, how you're relating to others. Um, and so, or it could also come up in how people are responding to you. So if you are noticing that your, um, um, you know, your relationships are being affected um, and it's coming up at, at work, it's coming up at home, it's coming up with family, it's coming up with, uh, you know, you will notice a certain pattern happening everywhere. And that's when you're kind of like, okay, what is it that is happening within me? What is it that I am doing or not doing or should be doing? Um, and so that's when you're going to have to kind of kind of take a pause and sit back and just sit with yourself and see what it is that um, is going on. So uh, it definitely will. Even if we try, sometimes we try to keep ourselves busy. Um, so we uh, distract ourselves so that we don't um, take an inner look. Uh, we, you know, you find people who are um, interact, um, um, they, they get, you know, they dig, the, dig themselves in their work or they, you know, whatever extracurricular activities or they, they get, they distract themselves. And that is actually a trauma response. So mm -hmm. you are trying to cover up, distract, whatever it is that is coming up, but you're trying to kind of suppress or repress. Um, so that's how, um, these wounds will come up, um, even if you try to hide them under the rug somehow, but they will pop up uh, at a later time. It could stay dormant for about a year, two, 10, 20. Yes. But then it will come up when you're 50, 60. I know um, things that do come up can come up at a later time without you even recognizing. So they do, and you will know. Uh, your body you will, will be able to make the association. You'll, you know, you put in the work and then you'll be able to say, okay, hang on a second that, you know, and, and it kind of hits, I think for, for me personally, it was kind of waves of, of just going back and realizing, oh my God, that is the, you know, it's kind of going through that film reel in your head and, and realizing the snapshot there is like, oh, that was the situation that kind of changed the trajectory of my thoughts or how I felt about myself or something related to that. So I'd love us to get to the recommendations slides and then, um, and each of you please uh, to um, elaborate and then we can take the question. We're starting to get some questions. So let's get through the recommendations and then we'll go through the questions. Let me share that again. There we go. Okay, so Nihal, please. So these are just for for what um, for everyone that is with us. Thank you again for being here. Um, we thought, how do we sum up? Because again, we could be talking about this for a very long time, and we could be telling you stories till tomorrow. But um, we thought, let's let's bring a slide that brings in three recommendations of what are your next steps moving forth. How do you initiate your healing, your individual, and again. These are not set in stone. These are recommendations. And we'd like you to explore with them, not necessarily all of them, 
but explore with something. You just start somewhere. And what we're doing here is just bringing the awareness. And then the rest, as I said, the rest is on you. And of course, seek the certified support that could help you and guide you through this process. Um, don't be, um, don't expect that you'll be able to do it by yourself. And uh, please do verify the people you work with because some people could do more harm, unfortunately. So um, Nihal, our uh, um, counselor, please, you can take us so, through the- So the taking, um, so looking at uh, what we were just talking about, I think the first thing, first recommendation is um, when you are in feeling, a, when you are in a certain situation or uh, having an issue, just be aware um, and identify your triggers, um, whether you're feeling rejected, abandoned, um, betrayal, loss, whatever they are, and how that relates to, you know, the different um, attachment styles that I um, uh, mentioned. Um, so that's the first one. Can you one. just recap them again quickly, please, Michal? Yeah, uh, the attachment first styles? Yeah, the first one is the secure attachment style. Um, the second one is the avoidant attachment style. The third is the anxious. Um, and the fourth is the fearful anxious um, attachment style. So just be aware of the triggers. And, um, you know, when, when you are aware of which one you're at, um, and again, there's no set rule. You can be secure, but sometimes you, an insecurity will pop up. Um, so just be aware of that and be aware of your triggers. The second one moving on is um, affirming. Give yourself that affirmation that you're not getting what you need in this situation. So I need to be validated or I need to feel accepted um, and, uh, or to be seen or heard. So um, give yourself that. Give yourself that affirmation that this is what you're needing in this situation. Um, and um, the last recommendation is called the empty chair technique. Actually, I use um, a lot when you are, say, for instance, you're sitting and in front of you is an empty chair. And it's that, you know, that in, in our situation here, when we're talking about the inner child, it's the, the inner child is the one that's sitting in the empty chair in front of you. And you are, um, you know, you say to yourself what you needed to hear growing up as that little child. Um, or that inner child. So what is the adult me um, or the caregiver me is going to say to the inner child me in this particular situation? So um, I will be the caregiver that I needed when I was little. So it's a, it's a very uh, inward, uh, in-depth, uh, takes a lot of awareness and a lot of control, self-control, inner control, to be able to give yourself that in that situation, um, to give yourself that comfort that you needed, whatever it was. So those are my three recommendations. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> try it out for size. <laughs> yes, try it out. Especially the last one. It's it's like strong. Yes. It, and you've got to be prepared for those. It's very ways. strong. Oh my God, those kind of aha moments for you. <laughs> When, when, when that aha moment came, comes, uh, you know, it's like, okay, what do I tell myself? What do I need to hear now as that inner child that's just yearning for that acceptance or yearning for that validation? Or I just want to, th when you're throwing in the tantrums, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. what do I need to tell myself to comfort me? So that's, that's beautiful. Um, what, oops, sorry. Hang on. Uh, how did this Okay, how do we get to the next page? There we go. Is this it? Yes, no, no. Hang on. Apologies for that. <laughs> well, let's, let's move on to the next page and then we can do it. Technical stuff. There it is. Nahitab, your recommendations, please. Well, uh, thank you so much, Nihal. It's inspiring. I love this empty chair as well. And I think after this webinar, I'll go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I have another aha moment and discover other wounds. Uh, all the work I'm going to discuss, it's the credit of the positive intelli intelligence of Shiza Chamin to give credit to all of this. And as I was saying, there is, we have subconscious saboteur. The master sub saboteur is the judge. And the judge has nine accomplices. 
every one of us has like a percentage of these accomplices. I'll just mention them, the nine, and then I'll take an example, what do I mean? We have the controller, the one who likes to control everything, so everyone has to follow like he wants. We have the hyper achievers, like always running after the carrot, achievement after achievement. Yes, yes, I am. I have it. So it's like you don't enjoy it, just running after the achievement. The vigilant, and I gave you an example, always being scared, thinking about the negative. The rational, the rational, the hyper rational who doesn't allow emotions to come in. The victim, the victim, and this is like a the victim. You understand what I mean when I say victim? Always feel that he is the victim of himself, of circumstances, of other people. The restless. He has to be doing every. He has to be busy, so he's always finishing something, doing something else. He wants. It's like somehow like the avoider because the avoider, like Nihal was saying, one who doesn't really avoid, and the perfectionist. Everything should be perfect. Nothing should be mediocre. People should get the job done. The, everything should, like Nikel, perfect. And the pleaser who always wants to please other people. So I invite you all, the link is here, to do, this is a free test, to assess your top saboteurs. And don't worry, we all have them, different percentage. And this could help you to understand, because how do you know there is saboteur? It is when you have a negative feeling. And like Nihal was saying, you feel it in the body. Negative feelings affect us in the body. Once you have negative feeling, that means there is a subconscious saboteur behind it. So what you do is like to, to like to intercept the saboteur is with the, like, like Nihal said, you will feel it in the body, you'll feel it in your emotion, you will feel it here, you'll feel it in your hands. You'll be as if you're in a fight flight mood. I mean, it's like worried, guilty, sad, it's all the negative feelings, but there is a way. It is to move to the sage, to intercept the saboteur, and then to be able to move to the sage. And the sage, we have like five resorts we can use. We can use empathy and being empathetic with ourselves, empathetic with the others, or we can be in the explorer mood, like, like an Egyptologist or anthropologist trying to explore, excited what I'm, I'm going to face, or to be into the innovate, like the creative, where, what can I do? How could I change it differently? Or navigate, like to look in the future, like Nihal was saying to the empty share, but look in 10 years, how would, how would I look into this situation? And the activate, being laser focused. I mean, like a Jedi, like, you know, like it's, it's like to be really focused. And here I'll take one exercise and I'll take it from Nihal and I'll use the chat. I, I, I invite you all to look at this picture Get a small picture and please, if you are on the chat, write what comes across your mind, whatever cross, comes across your mind. It's like when you see this child, this two year child, what comes into your mind? Everyone, I invite every one of you to bring his own, this is my picture by the way. And I want you to hold your picture and look really into this picture to discover your real essence and to, to write, I am, put the picture, put, get, bring your own picture and write, I am. When I look at this picture, my personal picture, I looked at it and I said, I'm free, I'm happy, I am peace of mind, I'm loved and I'm protected. These are my real essence. So when the saboteur comes, it changes my real, it doesn't change my real essence. It affects us, it hijacks me. So everyone, I invite you to get your picture and write the word I am. This is your real essence. And this is what we, we need to protect and have. And this exercise help us because whenever you are in a bad situation, imagine this person having five years, two years old and imagine his real essence. You will have empathy to this guy, to this person. When you feel bad about yourself, imagine yourself two years old, three years old, and have empathy for yourself. So, and always have this picture. Honestly, when I'm working, whenever there is anything, I always have it to my side. I always see it. So whenever I have a bad feeling, I just, 
I sometimes forget what I have written. This is why I wrote it. Once I did the exercise, I wrote it because sometimes I'm hijacked by the saboteur and I forgot, I forget my real essence. So I invite you to do this. Finally, the question is, how do we stop and intercept the saboteur? And it's really easy. It's doing mental fitness. And here I, I'll give you a couple of small exercises. Whenever you have bad feelings in your body, whenever you have in your thoughts and emotions, bring two fingertips against each other, hold them. And with each finger, if you can close your eyes, it's great. We don't have time now. I'll explain the exercise, but later. Do this exercise closing your eyes. Rub two fingertips against each other with such a tension that you can feel the fingertips ridges on both fingers. Feel the sensation. Put your timer on, your iPhone, whatever. Put it on and do this exercise, closing your eyes and really concentrating on that. That's an exercise. Another exercise, and that's a great one if you're in a meeting in front of everyone or, or people are around, you cannot tell them just to start doing like this and doing uh, exercises. This is like, now, try to find as many as your toes, as much as you can, identify them. You want to, you might want to wiggle your toes a little to find as many as your toys and concentrate on this exercise. Because sometimes we're there outside and we feel worried, scared, angry. Just do that, stop and do that. And the exercise, another one is breathing. Yes, breathe, but breathe with the sensation. Whatever, feel the air going inside and going outside. And finally, try to listen to the farthest sound or the closest sound, it might be your own. I mean, when you're breathing, your own breathing. If you can do 15 minutes daily, 15 minutes daily, divide it all over the day, like three minutes, five times, or even five minutes, three times a day, and do these exercises with a timer, I guarantee you in eight weeks, you will know how to intercept the saboteur and shift from a negative feeling to a sage. So these are my recommendation. I hope I was clear enough. I'm on mute and I started talking. So I love them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for them, Mahita. It's, um, I think the bottom line is um, the, the, the mental fitness practices that you just uh, discussed are about bringing your awareness back to the presence, to your physical presence, and that intercepts your, um, your thoughts. And uh, Tony Robbins speaks of this a lot. He says, you know, that by changing your physiology, you can change your mental state. So if you're not feeling good, and he always has this, like I attended his uh, Unleash the Power Within and like a lot of other trainings that he's done. And it's about getting people up and dancing and jumping around and stuff. It's just because you have to change your physiology. You can't get stuck in that state of mind, because again, the loop will never end. And I think that's a part of it. So and you'll be um, hijacked. Yes. You'll be exactly. hijacked into your saboteur. So don't believe everything your brain is telling you. Don't believe him. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so um, then I'm going to give a few very short recommendations after the beautiful ladies that just did it. Um, so from, from my perspective, and again, just to, to kind of give context to what I talk about, I work a lot with, um, with people when it comes to mindset, because I realized that was my secret ingredient where I realized that again, coming out of the hyperachiever, I've got to do everything. And, you know, I've, I'm a perfectionist and, and all of that, realizing that I still had that feeling of not being good enough, of not being worthy. And this is, you know, after I've, I was done with all the education there ever is to be, I was done with my doctorate degree. I had like reached the end of the ladder and still I was looking, where's the next ladder? And um, I realized that was a kind of a pattern in my life. And that's where I wanted to heal. And that's where, well, that's literally what Ahmed was asking earlier is like, how do you know? that? That's what got me to the awareness of knowing that I have inner child wounds and going through the coaching and going through uh, forms of therapy. I'm not going to say that I sat in a chaise longue, but I did get some forms of therapy one way or another. So that's my first recommendation. It's the conduct audit 
an audit of your repeating patterns. I talk to a lot of people and I used to be, um, um, had the same mindset is it was always repeated. And I was always saying, you know, no, no, this, this is just, it's not about me. It's about everyone else. And, um, and I realized that I, again, fell into the victim mentality. Again, it was life is happening and this is number three, but still it was about, why is this repeated? Why am I worried always about my weight and my, and consequently my health? Why am I losing the weight and then putting it back on again? And these are things that I realized it was because it had the associations with my upbringing, with my um, environment and things that happened to me. And thus, if you feel like you are stuck now at a point where you keep saying, why is this happening to me? Or I can't get into it. There are no good men or there are no good women in the world. Then this is a part where you say, let me look at the pattern let me audit my life and let me audit everything else that comes along with it. Number two is we expect too much of ourselves and not in a way that we should not strive for anything. I'm saying that we, as both Nihal and Mahitab have been saying earlier, we need to be kind to ourselves and we need to give ourselves the space and the empathy to grow out of whatever is holding us back. We, this is generational, possibly. This is your lifetime. This is years upon years, possibly decades of being stuck in that same place. And thus, once you start bringing the awareness and then the taking it a step further and doing the actions, make sure that these actions are small incremental steps and small incremental mindset shifts. Don't expect yourself to change overnight. It just won't happen. And then you're going to go back to that loop of beating yourself up about it and feeling guilty about it and feeling shame with it. And that is not, should not be the case. If you're trying to heal a wound, don't cause other wounds along the way. Last but not least, learn to break free of the victim mentality. Um, Tony Robbins has the statement, and I know I talk of Tony Robbins a lot. And for those that don't enjoy Tony Robbins, I apologize. I'm not sorry. I do apologize, though. I learned a lot. I extracted the things that really, really did support me. Anyhow, going back, he has the statement that life happens for us and not to us. And that for me was the, the kind of bringing it all like kind of a snapshot of what the victim mentality is about. It's about saying, you know, why is this happening to me? Why is everyone doing this to me? Why is the circumstances not serving me? And I used to have the same conversations, but I learned to extract it and I learned to shift it around to now, what can I do about it? How can I approach this? Who can I talk to? And it's shifting. Instead of the why, 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 I started using the other Ws and the and the edge. So I started using the why, the who, the where, the when, the how, and that helped a bit. So it's breaking free of the victim mentality. It is understanding that even if it's only 5% control over your life, over your circumstances, over the environment, internal and external for you, that still means that you have 5% control. It does not necessarily have to be 100% control. We are not detached from reality, claiming that you can have 100% control over your life. But we know that you can incrementally shift that towards what serves you and what serves your life. So um, these are our recommendations. Let's stop this share here. There we go. And I think this is the part where we could say, uh, let's look at some of the questions. We have a, a few people here. We have a few questions here. Let's address Sorry, Facebook people, we're going to address, I've got Facebook on my iPad on the side, so that's why I'm looking on the side. Um, Facebook people, we're going to address the people on the Zoom, and, uh, and we're definitely going to get to your questions next. So um, one of the chats, Hanan, hi, Hanan. <laughs> she said, mindset shifts need a lot of effort and practice. Yes, and that's why we say they're small incremental ones. You cannot change your inner dialogue overnight where we have to be realistic about that. We talk about transformational vocabulary. Mal Robbins talks about mindset reset, but it is small shifts. But more importantly, as Nihal was saying earlier as well, it comes with awareness. You have to realize that these mindsets 
um, or these, the, your inner dialogue or even your outer dialogue, the expressions that you're using all the time, they are not serving you. And they are a reflection of something that is blocking you. You're finding an excuse one way or another. So um, Nihal, do you have anything to add to that? Or do you want us to address the next question? With the mindset shifts? Yes. Well, for me, I think the mindset shift definitely is, um, is um, you know, how we uh, connect with our narratives um, sure. and how we think and what we tell ourselves. Um, and uh, so coming from a background of like the, the cognitive kind of behavioral, how our thoughts impact our behaviors and our minds. So definitely changing the narratives, changing the thought process, and um, yeah, so definitely it does need a lot of effort. It does, it's like you're training, you're, you're rewiring your brain, you're rewiring the neurons um, and you, you're, you're, you, know, you have a certain way of thinking and you kind of move to the next track and you find yourself going back to this track. And so it's retraining, rewiring, and uh, it does um, just like uh, you're training a child, you kind of um, are training them to walk. So they kind of take a couple of steps and then they fall. They take a couple of steps and then they fall. Um, they, they, they hold on to the couch or whatever. So this is exactly the same thing when it comes to mindset shifts and rewiring of your thought process. It takes a lot of, um, of training, definitely. Sure. But be patient with yourself. <laughs> Right. Uh, because, yes, exactly. Be patient with yourself. And I think that's, yes. that's the bottom line over here. Cha -cha right. uh, <laughs> it, it's a yeah. mental, like it's a mental muscle. The brain is a mental muscle. And this is what I'm saying. Practicing 15 minutes daily is really practicing your mind. It's like a muscle. You can't start, you cannot shift in one day. And this is why we say minimum positive intention. It's minimum eight weeks. So yes. you on a daily 15 minutes practice because you are telling your brain to stop, stop the thinking and shift and it takes time. And your mind, whenever exercise you do, it will wonder. So you have to have empathy with that. It's okay. And in positive intelligence, we say every three steps of improvement, there are two steps you go back. Every three steps, there are two backs. So it's like really training because you can't run a marathon one time like this you train for it yeah so the same for and our brain nihal the three steps two steps that's the cha-cha we were talking about huh yes. <laughs> we we dubbed it the cha-cha dance <laughs> yeah and see the thing is as well when it comes to training your mind or mindset as well um or training to, you know behaviors what i say is you know the 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 longer you, you the, the the dance going back and forth it will, in between each back and forth or, or setback, it's longer. And the time you spend in that setback is shorter. True. So, so that's, you know, you're, you're training well <laughs> sure. by time span is longer and shorter when you're there. And you know what? The, the third aspect or the third dimension of it too is that the impact is, is, um, is I don't know, uh, impact, you would say what? Smaller impact? You bounce less, back? Yeah, yeah, less impactful. So yeah. you'd still get impacted. You'd still get the the, the blow yes. of it, but that blow kind of gets dim diminishes with time a bit. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, Marwa says, how can you relate a certain incident uh, or a special way of a relationship that that is the one that wounded you and related to your behavior in adulthood? Uh, the past. So, Nihal. <laughs> Yeah, this me. is the part where we talk about the past. <laughs> <laughs> past is you. Then my dad and I could take the present and future. <laughs> How do you know that that was uh, the one that wounded you? Yeah. Um, I guess you it's every signs, for example. I, I guess it's your self awareness or your um, some things are in the subconscious. And they, um, they do pop up. And when they do pop up in a certain, in that situation, you, um, you know, things that we are reminded of, there are some things that are um, suppressed in our subconscious and we don't recognize and we don't know that that is the wound. We don't even know that that is there. Um, and, um, but then you, it will come up somehow later on and you will start the processing and it's all about your awareness. 
Um, yeah. If it is related to your behavior in adulthood, most likely, most likely it would be. Um, and again, it's about things that are um, stored in our subconscious, but then they become conscious. Either you intentionally put it in the forefront or it will be put for you. So um, that's how, you know, you will uh, kind of uh, uh, know that that's going to, that that is happening to you. And again, it's patterns recurring. Um, yes. You will, it will recur in every situation. So it's not just, for instance, like it's happening in your, um, uh, in your relation, your, with your partner. No, it is happening at work. It is happening with your child. It is happening with a friend. So yeah, the sure. patterns recur in every kind of relationship, in every kind of connection. So that's how you're going to know that that is an inner child wound. That's true. Now, the example I used for myself when I was worried is because of the incident that happened in the bus. So every for time for me is always aware. I, I was always, and whenever I have a meeting, so it's like recurring. I have grown up with the time awareness, a very high awareness from a very aggressive comment from someone. So, and I think with relationships as well, um, it's, it's really about, I mean, how do you figure out which one was the culprit, which relationship was the culprit? And I think the, the, it's possibly the one that's hurt the most because that's the one that you were all in. And thus mm -hmm. that is the, the impact again, going back to the impact factor, that's the one that's impacted you possibly. It could have been something really small. It could have been an act that is really small in terms of the bigger scheme of things and the bigger picture, but that is the one that had the most impact on you. And accordingly, this is the one that could have shifted you or wounded you the most moving forward. Um, and from, from that, actually, Marwa has a follow-up question asking about, the, is this, if we are talking about, um, why, why do you have, you have your hand raised, Mahita? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was like, a mistake. Why do you have hand raised? <laughs> technical part guys so don't worry about that part um she has the follow-up question saying is it is it as we grow older is it more difficult to heal uh, personally i i think to actually you you get to capitalize on the experience mm -hmm. on wisdom and mm -hmm. on on reaching i think beyond the 40 it's a whole new ball game of saying you know what i don't care and let me go through this but I, that's on a personal level. Um, Nihal, would you but think? I do want to say, but I do want to say something. It's about your level of aware insight and level of awareness and how willing you are to dig deep. Some people um, are uh, want to stay in that uh, denial. I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. So um, is it more difficult to heal? Uh, yeah, because things are going to keep popping up and they're going to keep becoming painful and they do not want to dig deep uh, because digging deep is going to be painful. Um, and so it's how, um, how, how willing you are to do the work. That is how far you are going to heal. But also so. it's, it's also related to them talking of digging deep and it's going to be painful. This is about, do you want to keep applying band-aids to the same wound yep. or do you want to actually flush out that wound? Do you really right. want to heal? If right. you want to heal, you have to do the work. If you want yep. to heal, it's going to get ugly before it gets to, to start kind of putting back together the, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the skin regenerating and everything just kind of healing and the wound no longer being there. But if we keep just putting on bandages, if we keep just putting on addressing it as if it's not there, if I put some antiseptic on it, it's going to be okay for another day. That is where the awareness comes in. That's where I think it's a point of enough is enough. I'm tired mm -hmm. dealing with the same thing. I'm tired having to go through the same situations. I'm tired having that same pain, that same nagging feeling inside of me and saying, now it needs to disappear or actually it never disappears, but now it needs to hurt less. And I think that is the point of where the awareness and the action come into interception. That's the interception point of where you could move forward now. Right. Um, okay. So Nihal, you have another question on Facebook now. <laughs> okay. So it's like, Seriously. when uh, this is from Renda and she says, when you grow up in a large family, relatively your caregivers would be a mix of all attachment styles that you have described. 
So does that affect you in growing without childhood wounds? As in, could this be a plus? Without childhood wounds? As yeah. So you have all attachment styles? So if you've got a large family and you've got the caregivers having the mix of all the attachment styles, does that mean right. that you're, you could have dodged that bullet? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and who is this? What is the name? Renda. Renda Helmi. Renda. Um, I don't know if you dodged that bullet. I think you got a couple, a lot of bullets at your face coming to you. Um, so I, I would say um, if you've uh, got all the attachment styles or the caregivers, um, I'm sure you have kind of, um, uh, it's like a, a, a mixed bag really. Um, but again, what, what are you going to do with it? So how are you going to heal from it? So um, you have all the different attachment styles at you with you. What, how are you going to reach the secure one? So you've got the, uh, ang ang your ang the anxiety, the anxious, the fearful anxious, you've got the avoidant. So how are you going to um, work around those three insecurities, insecure attachment styles to reach to becoming the secure attachment style. So I think that's where the work is. I mean, I think it's triple. Uh, I don't think you dodged the bullet. I'm not sure, but I think uh, you've, you've got probably more work. But again, if you really look at each one of us, we've gotten a, a little piece of everything, but we have the dominant one most. So um, I don't think you're alone in that. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but again, it's how do you reach um, to the secure attachment style in all of this? Sure. Mahitab, would you, th would you say that that would also mean that there's a mix of saboteurs in there? Would that have impacted the saboteurs? Hang on, you're, you're muted. Okay. You yeah. will have actually the, the all the saboteurs uh, being activated. I mean, definitely. We, the nine of them, we have them with different degrees, but they will be yeah. activated if you have all these attachments available. And yeah. I, I invite her really to do the positive intelligence, uh, the saboteur assessment. Yes. Um, just I wanted to actually reminded me, let me let me read out loud again the, the link. And that we're going to put it in the comments now of the live, okay. but it's positiveintelligence.com slash backslash assessments. So that's where you get um, the free uh, assessment link. Holly, such a powerful discussion. Thank you, ladies. So insightful. So many ahas happening for me. Thank you, Holly. I love Holly. She, she always, she's like, Holly is really actively, she's, she's a coach as well. And she's really actively working on, on healing and she's, mm -hmm. she's, opened up. she's, she has opened to, taken in a lot of input. So I, I love when Holly does a comment. I was like, yay, Holly. So Target <laughs> uh, was wondering what the discussion is, but um, Hiba, Hiba, yeah, Hiba replied to him. So thank you, Hiba, for, uh, for replying there. Suzanne says, um, I have same feelings like you, Dr. Hannah. It's a very hard feeling. I'm, I believe this was the one where this, I was talking about the not good enough and uh, feeling not worthy. And um, Suzanne, I'd love to tell you something. Um, I don't want you to feel that it's a, it's a hard feeling or it's a tough feeling or a bad feeling. Don't, don't give it any negative associations because, as you said, now that you've brought awareness to it, now that you've put a spotlight on it, you're on the first step. And that in itself is a blessing. Um, a lot of people spend a lifetime, as I think Ahmed was, was trying to comment earlier, that a lot of people spend a lifetime not knowing that they've got wounds or not knowing that there's something that they need to heal or work on. Now that you know that, go to the root. Again, always go to the root. What is it that you've been doing, uh, whether it's a pattern or an audit or something, and what is it that made you feel that way? And my advice, and this is something that really, really worked for me, would be redefine what worthiness means to you and what's good enough mean to you and what your success parameters. And never associate good and enough. You're great as you are just, and you're worthy as you are, just make sure that you're redefining those parameters for yourself. And this accordingly, that will help you onto the next level. And you 99% of the time you will realize that
you're more than amazing. And you don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, Heba, she's in agreement so with what we're saying. So thank you so much. Laila Harun says, great discussion. Thank you. Uh, Lubnam Lu, my, my best friend, she's online too. So she was giving a thumbs up when I said, thank you for the therapy sessions. <laughs> Hello, Laila. <laughs> so um, I think that is it, unless I'm not seeing yet again. I Oh, we have more comments. Uh, more comments came in. I tried to refresh. Uh, we have uh, Maisa JUC. She said, thank you, ladies, for these useful steps. It's, it's forgiveness, nice. a way of healing our inner child. And is it healthy to forgive someone who hurt us in order to heal our wounds? Uh, I, hello, how are you, Maisa? I know Maisa, that I'm happy she's around. Well, it is here when we have to practice empathy because this person who hurt us was not in his real essence. He was probably under the saboteur. He was hijacked because we are all born with really great essence. No one is born to hurt other people. So it is difficult. And this is where the saboteur hijacks. How could you forgive him? He did this and that, did that. And or her, it, or her, or her, or her, her, or her, her. yes, <laughs> or, or, or it's her. Not against the man normally. No, 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 him, her. But I mean, and it's, sometimes it's even the children. Sometimes we're even angry yes. at our children. You know, like yes. even that. But, but just we imagine this person becoming five years old, but we don't know the circumstances this person has been through. We don't know his childhood, his bringing up. So it is difficult. I'm not saying it's easy. It's a practice. But it starts by being empathetic with ourselves so we can have empathy for other people. So it is possible, but it requires a lot of training and a lot of awareness. That's true. Um, I think uh, yes, um, if I, help, jump please. In, um, I think I, um, I have a different take on, on this when it comes to the caregiver and forgiveness, if that, if that is the, the, the I mean, forgiveness is a, is a huge kind of uh, uh, shadow kind of thing on top of us. So it's a cloud. Um, we're always kind of uh, culturally, socially um, asked, oh, you have to forgive or forgive the, you know, the, the whoever did the hurt to you. Um, it's a journey. Um, and it's only when you're ready. Um, it's only when you know um, that you are ready to forgive. Sometimes forgiveness um, is you don't have to forgive. There's no pressure to forgive. Um, there is, um, you know, you can, you know, um, you can, um, I guess, uh, and when I talk about the acceptance of that, th this is what they knew how to do. Yes, you, this is what they knew how to do, or this is what they knew how to give, but that does not mean that that didn't hurt that does not mean that there is, mm -hmm. there's, there's that pain still there. And that's why I actually said in the beginning, you know, there, there might be some things that will come up for you. Um, and forgiveness is not for everyone. Some people will choose to forgive and some people will not. And, and that's okay. And, you know, it does not, um, it does not mean even when you do forgive, it doesn't mean that you have to talk to that person again, or it has to, you have to have a relationship with that person again. Um, it does not mean that at all. So, um, and some people are okay and they've moved on. It doesn't mean that uh, if you haven't forgiven that you can't move on. No, there are people that do move on, but they just, you know, they're at, they're at, a, at a, a good place of saying, I'm not forgiving. And then there are others where they do want to, and that's their journey. So please, when it comes to forgiveness, um, just uh, again, be in tune with where you're at. There's no timeline, there's no rush, there's no, there's nothing of that. So um, allow yourself to feel and be whatever it is that you're feeling for that other person. I think there's, there's also this, um, this very fine line of differentiation between forgiving and letting go. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's about letting go of the pain um, just because you no longer want to give power to that other person or that incident or whatever happened in your life. So that does not take power over your life because mm -hmm. by default, when, when we're angry at someone where we feel like they were unjust to us or mm -hmm. a circumstance or whatever happened, again, that, 
that strips away our power of choice, of feeling mm-hmm. good, of feeling better. And I think there's a part where, yes, you can start negotiating with yourself, whether you are ready to forgive or the other part is I can let go as I process through my feelings and process through my thoughts, because then the letting go saying, had they known better, they would have done better. But more importantly, how can I move forth from here? And that is also, I, I believe that that for me worked very well. Um, after about two to three years of pure anger and resentment at certain things in my life <laughs> until I got to the point of, I am not happy where I am. And there's no point of these people who hurt me understanding that they can, that they're going to change or understand the context of how they hurt me because they don't see, they don't see from where I see, they don't have that same perspective and everything. So I learned to process through it and to let go and to be able to move on. So maybe that is also um, a third option when, when we're talking about forgiveness and, um, an understanding and also having the empathy on the other side. Um, then who else is here? Uh, Randa was saying early realization of the secure detachment dodged the bullet. So she, she that's her belief now <laughs> after the one with the many attachment styles and, and the, the big family, Holly is very happy that we've identified the, the striving for the ladder and then the next one and continuous, um, the, Hyperachiever, so she's happy that uh, she's she's looking at that saboteur right now. Uh, who else? Uh, Heba says that she was coached by you, Mahitab, and she really and uh, it really worked for her. So she's happy with that. Hi, Heba. <laughs> <laughs> who else? Uh, Suzanne's enjoying the discussion. Uh, Heba is saying very insightful discussion. Nashwa, Nashwa's on online. She says thank you, Nihal, Hanan, and Mahitab. Um, ladies, again, Soha. So Kamal says, thanks, ladies. A very insightful discussion. So happy, so happy. Everyone could join us. Do we have any further comments or chats here? Uh, Iman says, uh, Iman Azab says, thank you for an excellent informative webinar. We're very happy. It's our pleasure. Okay. So ladies, do you have, um, let's wrap this up. Let's say one final statement, one advice, one thought, one closing uh, argument <laughs> like this is the kind of the the style I, I will uh, I will advise everyone when there is a negative feeling or, or bad circumstances first to accept it and look for the gift and opportunity whenever there is a really whenever there is bad circumstance or there is always a gift it's up to you to turn it into a gift and opportunity it's all in your hands you are responsible for your happiness for your peace of mind for everything so and and see yes when ask around ask around there is a lot like this webinar come and around just listen and everything is possible if i could go from being someone so worried to becoming towards my peace of mind, anyone can do it. So just be positive about it. Love that. Nihal? Um, I think, uh, I think uh, my takeaway uh, generally over the, my, my journey uh, is um, put yourself as a priority, put your healing as a priority and uh, because the only, um, the, the, the most significant relationship is your relationship with yourself. Sure. And when you heal that, then you heal everything else, all your other relationships. And when you are able to give yourself what you need, uh, and I know sometimes that's a very difficult concept for, for someone, um, but when you are able to have that internal um, self-healing kind of, you're able to give yourself that you, it changes the dynamics with yourself and everyone else around you. So I think that's my take all and, um, be the caregiver that you needed and give yourself what you needed to hear or whatever it was. So I love that. Um, I think my, my takeaway from my healing journey as well, uh, that is ongoing. I don't think it will ever end. I don't want it to end. I'm enjoying it too much <laughs> with all the pain and all the revelations coming through it. 
Now I'm turning into more of a, I don't know, is it masochist or something? But anyhow, <laughs> um, no, my, my takeaway is really, um, it is following on the same lines that it is an amazing thing to rid yourself of any shame and guilt that are related to any of your wounds. Uh, there's a lot of power within that. Um, being vulnerable is the ultimate power realizing that, well, of course, we have always said and we've always known that no one is perfect. We've just never practiced it in our heads. It's either, you know, you, you're either perfect or you're nothing. And I think there's a whole lot of a, of a, of a spectrum between this. And uh, it's appreciating yourself, um, loving yourself and um, respecting that your journey to date has entailed um, amazing results where you see flaws as Mahdab was saying, these are opportunities for you to become a better version of yourself, to make yourself proud. And I think when we prioritize ourselves from that manner, we come from a place that um, my message of empowerment, where you're self-empowered, you are, um, when you're self-empowered, you're able to become a beacon and you're able to create a ripple effect to everyone else in your life, to those that love you, to those that are in your um, um, kind of really direct circle, or actually you could be impacting a lot more um, people than you would ever imagine. So, well, it's my slogan, empowered you, empowers others. I really do believe in that. I really do believe that um, you bringing awareness to your wounds, you bringing awareness to your, um, to your shortcomings from your perspective, not from societal expectations, see what you, where you are, what you want for your life, where you see your vision is, define it for you, and then accordingly get on working. There's nothing's going to come easy. You got to get on doing it. It's going to get uh, the metamorphosis of the butterfly. It's yucky oh, yeah. in the middle, but a beautiful oh, yeah. butterfly comes out of it. <laughs> so get to butterflying, get to that cocoon, and then accordingly um, go through your process. Ladies, it was beautiful. Let me just thank everyone who just put the last comments in. Um, Ahmed, it was my pleasure. Hanan, thank you. Habibti, thank you. And yes, being vulnerable is the ultimate power. It is, it is. And, and I think once we start accepting it and once we start um, accepting the fact that we don't have to be perfect on the outside because everyone else expects it of us, I think when we start, and I say this message to my son, make yourself proud. When we start making ourselves proud, everything else falls into place. Ladies, thank you. I'm honored and humbled to have shared the, the, the webinar with you and thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you so much, Hanan. It's my pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Hanan and Nihal. I am so happy to be with you today, really. Thank you, thank you everyone, for joining us. Um, empowered you, empowers others. So um, please keep at it and uh, please create the best version of yourself possible for you and for everyone else who loves you and who depends on you. Have a beautiful evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Empowered to Grow podcast. For further engagement with a tribe of empowered women, join my Facebook group, Empowered to Grow, or visit my website, www.hananelbasha.com. I'll catch you on the next episode. And until then, know that empowered you empowers others. Love, abundance, and prosperity to you all.